I know that she was she wasn't buried, she was cremated, but if we could hear her right now, she'd be saying, Yeah, you can bury the workman, but the work will go on. I can just hear her now. Yeah. Alright, so this song is a new one. I want to give you a little context. Ryan, you should turn that background music off and make it a little, you know, <laughs> more intimate. <laughs> so uh, you know, a lot of you guys know that I work at an organization called Narragate, and we've got uh, a lot of guys that are coming into the program looking for life, looking for meaning, looking for purpose. And in their first phase, they commit to discipleship. They make a commitment to Jesus. And this last foundation class that graduated, that moved into the second phase, was on Valentine's Day. And so we did a little worship session, and we played this song on Valentine's Day. And I didn't realize it at the time, but... This song really is a it's, a, it's a love song, you know, between us and our creator. And so as we're singing this, you know, feel free to sing along if you want. The words are going to be up on the screen, but try to process that in your hearts. Try to, try to actually consider this a love song, you know, a love ballad of sorts.
Sometimes I'm under starlit sky, but I'm feeling more like dirt. How do I forget so fast who you are and what that's worth? If there's an evidence of you in every corner of this life, so why do I still try to prove? Sometimes I'm walking on a ledge And I'm afraid to just look down It's like I think I'm in control church family. How y'all doing? So I want to start you off with a question today. Have you ever come to a, a time in your life where you just question your existence? Like, why am I here? What's my purpose? See, I've come to that place before, and I believe we've all been there once or, you know, once or twice. 
But, um, you know, it's, it's what we do after we come to that place, you know, that defines our life. And I was looking for a specific answer that, uh, you know, a specific calling that God had had on my life. And he gave me something very general. He told me to serve, to love, just like Jesus did. It didn't matter about the specifics. I didn't have to know every little detail. I just needed to trust in him. And it's when I do those things, it's when I see the impact it has on the kingdom and it has on people's lives. You know, that's when I truly come to life. That's when it, it just, you know, just takes me over and that passion consumes me and that purpose really, really shows itself, you know? And uh, today you have that opportunity to join in in this life-changing work that we're doing here at this church. We're having a volunteer rally at uh, 1230 in the sanctuary today. And we'd love for you to come out, um, those who are volunteers. And if you want to be volunteers, you know, ask uh, one of the church members and they can get you hooked up. But we'd love to have you uh, there. Um, does anybody uh, does anybody plan on coming to the volunteer rally? Can I get a, a hand share? Show a show of hands, maybe. Show of hands. A couple. Okay, a couple. Cool. Well, we'll have fun. There's going to be uh, some free food, so we're going to be talking about the vision and, and mission uh, of our church. So we'd love to see y'all there. And now let's worship.
God, thank you for your overwhelming love. Your love is not fickle. There's no wall that's too big or too thick. There's no lie that's too big or too bad. And I, for one, am grateful for that. God, let this morning be a, an avenue, an opportunity for all of us in this room to experience Amen. you. Amen. Increase our sensitivity to your spirit, our awareness of your voice. And soften our hearts in preparation to receive whatever it is that you have for us. God, if there's something written in these notes that isn't from you, then just block it off the page because this needs to be, this needs to be just you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. It is a good day to be at church. Amen. Aren't you glad that Jesus saves? Amen. Like he could just not do that, but he did Amen. and he does. So if nothing else, we're not going to hell. <laughs> Thank you, God. That was kind of weak for that big of a, you know, <laughs> big of a deal. Like we're not going to an it. A place of eternal torment without anything that is God, you know, good, love, light, you know, peace. There we go. Well, this morning we're going to continue on in our fruition series where we're going through the fruit of the spirit. Okay, we've talked about love. We've talked about joy. We've talked about peace. We've talked about patience. Talked about kindness. Talked about goodness. And now we're going to talk about faithfulness. Okay, so I don't know about you guys, but before I began to prepare for the lesson on faithfulness, to me, faithfulness was like kind of the boring fruit. You know, kind of like, okay, yeah, faithfulness. Yeah, I love Jesus. Of course, duh. But in my studying and in my preparation for this lesson, I, I discovered that I had a great misunderstanding of what faithfulness was. And so it might just be my new favorite fruit of the Spirit. And so I think that I'm just going to step out on a limb and assume that I'm not the only one that misunderstood the fruit of faithfulness. So I'm just going to think maybe, you know, maybe 20 or 50 of you also misunderstood it. So titled this message, The Misunderstood Fruit. Because that's still true. Even if you guys all fully understood that fruit, I misunderstood it, so it's still an accurate title. Faithfulness, the misunderstood fruit. Um, there's actually, okay, so there's two different words in, the, in the, the Greek language for faithfulness. The first one is in, it's used in the, the sense of faithful, like, like be faithful. God is faithful. Whenever I say somebody is faithful, the thing that you think of in your mind or that I thought of in my mind is like reliable, right? Dependable, consistent. And that is accurate. That word is, is okay, I'm not Greek, so this could sound funny and it might be wrong. So if there's any Greek scholars in the room, just hold your tongue. It's pistos, P-I-S-T-O-S. Um, and it means reliable, consistent, dependable, keeps its promises. Um, it is... It makes someone worthy of belief or confidence or trust. So think of it as, as faith worthy, right? You're worthy of someone's faith, okay? Now, the other word, now that, let me stop there. That is what I believed faithfulness was. But the word in Gen, or, uh, Galatians 5 for faithfulness is actually a different word. It's very similar, but it's, it's pistis or something, P-I-S-T-I-S. And it actually means something different. It is of firm persuasion, conviction, um, belief in the truth. It's, it's veracity. You know, it's, it's, some, it's conformity to the truth. So think of it more as full of faith. So you've got worthy of faith and full of faith. So in a sense... 
you've got how fa- one aspect of it is how it how faithfulness behaves, and then the other aspect is how what faithfulness believes. And so I thought that was kind of cool in ceremony. So I, that's how I made my outline. We're going to talk about how faithfulness behaves, what faithfulness believes, and then of course we've got to have a practical element at the end to complete any good sermon, and that's where faithfulness begins. You like that three B's, how it behaves, what it believes. When it begins. You like that, don't you, Tony? I knew you would. I knew you would. So, let's talk about how faithfulness behaves. Okay? Um, There's really three different elements to faithfulness in its behavior that I really want to point out. And so the first one is integrity. Okay? Integrity is... Integrity just means whole. Complete. It actually, there's a root word in there, integer. You guys, any mathematicians in the room? An integer is a whole number as opposed to a fraction. So it's whole. It's complete. I used to do this um, Bible illustration where I would hold my Bible up and I would say, you know, what is this? And then you guys would say, oh, that's a Bible. And then I'd say, well, you know, how do you know it's a Bible? And then you'd say, well, because the bookmark and the, the leather cover and the, the, the thin, you know, gold pages and the, it says Holy Bible on the edge. And, you know, I can't obviously do this illustration now because I'm holding an iPad. But if I did hold, you know, a real Bible and you guys observed that it was a Bible and I opened it up and I started reading from it and it was just a list of words in alphabetical order with their definitions next to it, then you would say that is a dictionary. So that w- Bible that book would not have integrity because what it appears to be on the outside is different than what it is on the inside. So something that has integrity is whatever it is on the inside, that's what it appears to be on the outside. It's consistent. It's true. It has integrity. So I was thinking about how to, you know, how to kind of spice this message up. And I had some really good, uh, good luck with the, the memes last time that I preached. So I thought I'd bring back a few more pictures that I think are funny. And I wanted to, I wanted to specifically portray um, inconsistencies, funny things that don't have integrity. So let's stick our first slide up there, if you don't mind. Okay, so this is, a, this is a, an Earth Day marathon. And they're just throwing their cups on the ground. That's, that's, a, that's an inconsistency. They're celebrating the earth, keeping the earth clean, you know, recycle, and there's all this trash on the ground. Inconsistency number one. All right, how about that next slide? This is great. You got two billboards. One in three people in Louisiana will die from a heart disease. <laughs> Directly next to it, two for three croissant, which is from Burger King. I mean, somebody had to notice that. That is quite the inconsistency. See, let's see what the next one is. I actually don't know. Oh, this is great. This is College of Architecture and, Pla- Architecture and Planning. And they didn't leave enough room. They didn't plan ahead to make sure they had enough room for the C, so they put it on the brick wall there. That's great. That's great for marketing, isn't it, Penny? Come here and learn how to, how to be an architect and plan. Okay, next slide. Mall maintenance shop. We can repair anything. Please knock hard on the door. The bell doesn't work. Yep, we can repair anything, we just are too lazy to do it. (laughs) Inconsistency. All right, this is my favorite one. 24-hour fitness with escalators to the front door. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's real good. I bet they have uh, treadmills that run themselves, too, that you just (laughs) sit and watch. So this is a, this, these photos don't have integrity. You know, what they claim to be what they claim to have as their, their focal point, their mission, they are completely contradicting with escalators and croissant, which is, and yeah. So integrity, it just means to be whole, to be complete, to be through and through the same. A person of integrity, right? Now, now we've talked about what integrity is as a word, but let's talk about what it looks like in a person's life. A person of integrity means that their life is unified, right? They're not fractured. They're not fragmented, right? They don't, they don't have, uh, they're not two-faced, you know, one way in one set of circumstances and yet a different way in different set of circumstances. Um, let me give you an example. 
So I, a few years ago, I don't remember exactly, maybe it was a couple, a couple, of, uh, couple of years ago, I went on a, uh, fl- a trip to Florida with my wife and with the entire Lawless family. And so when we got there, we found ourselves talking about church and ministry and, you know, and then I think Miss Tammy was like, okay, we're not going to talk about work. We're not going to talk about, we're not going to talk shop here. This is, this is vacation. Well, it wasn't 20 minutes before we were back into church conversation, back into ministry. And, and what we realized is we can't help it. It's our life, right? It's what our heart beats for. It's the reason we do it. So to not talk about it, what would we talk about? Sports? I mean, you can only talk about the Gamecocks so much. <laughs> no, it was, it's, it's, it's who we are. It's, it's what our mission and purpose and calling is in life. And so, yeah, we couldn't help to talk about it. If we had tried to talk about anything else and refused to talk about, you know, ministry and, and church life, it would have been inconsistent with who we are. So it would have been out of integrity. You know, unfortunately, that's not the case with, with everyone. You know, we live in a world that is fractured, that is, it is fragmented. Now you've got, we live in a world where, where, where people, they, they have one value, set of values for one area of life and a different set of values for a different area of life. You know, back in the old days, there was, there was you had truth, all truth met at the top, right? And if you believed in the truth, then it, it influenced every aspect of your life. But today, we are told as as Christians, right, if we're Christians, okay, that's great for your private life, you know, you're, you're welcome to, to pray in your closet and read your Bible at home, but don't try to bring that into your public life, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't need to do that in, in, your, in schools and in, you know, the pu- public place, that Christianity stuff is for your private life, not your public life, you know, they, they, try, to, they try to legislate morality, don't try to impose your morality on me, uh, don't try to put your religion on me, you keep that to yourself. So they're, 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 it's called relativism. You know, they're, they're telling us how to, how to do our religion, but not to impose our religion on them. But at the same time, they're imposing their view of religion on us, you know? So it's like, you have to, you have to realize that when you're, when you're talking to someone like that, they are doing the very thing that they, you know, say not to do. It's a lack of integrity. We don't live in a culture that has integrity. It's not consistent with itself. So our modern way of thinking has no integrity. It doesn't believe in a truth that influences all aspects of life. So integrity is a part of faithfulness that's very important. The second element of faithfulness is honesty. What is honesty? Well, honesty is, you know, you, you would think it was telling the truth, you know, not telling lies. Of course. But it's, it's even deeper than that. It's even more fundamental. Honesty, to be honest, means to be absolutely consistent. You are consistent in all areas of life. You're consistent in the ways that you act compared to what you believe. You're consistent in the things that you've said. You're consistent in the things that you, you know, the people that you interact with. Honesty means to be absolutely consistent. So I'm going to pull up a, a verse for you here. Uh, 1 John 1, 5. John says, Now this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. This is a, a pretty profound verse that we can pull a whole lot of things out of. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. God is absolutely consistent with himself. Right? He cannot be anything other than what he is. It's just, it's his, it's his nature. He cannot contradict himself. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So faithfulness is an attribute of God that is expressed through the certainty and the unchanging nature of his promises. And what he says uh, you, there's a saying, you can take it to the bank. You know, God is completely consistent with himself. And that's really important. And we're going we're gonna to kind of touch back on that. So integrity and honesty are the two f- first two elements of faithfulness. The third one is truth. 
They're truth-centered, right? A faithful person is both has integrity, is honest, and is centered. Their life is centered on the truth. God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. This is the entire basis of understanding of truth, right? God is truth, right? Without God, there is no truth. And I don't mean truth in just the sense of um, the opposite of false or true as opposed to a lie. I mean truth as in absoluteness, right? Moral relativism fails because they don't believe in a truth. Anything can be truth. Your truth can be your truth. My truth can be my, my truth. And as long as your truth doesn't affect my truth, then we'll be good. But that fails. That sort of thinking fails because if there is no God, if there is no absolute truth, then there can be no truth. Generally speaking, murder is considered to be not a good thing. Okay? But if there's no truth, who can tell you? That it's not a good thing. What is good? What is good? What is bad? There is no such thing. Right? We have a conscience, and we know as, as, as Christians that that is God who has instilled on our hearts and our DNA his very nature. But those who don't profess to believe in a God cannot believe in an absolute truth, and that leaves them aimless and wandering as far as their, their, their morality goes. And so... Because truth is God, because God is truth, that's why all falsehood, that's why all um, untruth is wrong. Because it is a contradiction of all that is God. That's why we're called to be faithful. That's why we as believers are called to be people of integrity, honest, truth-centered. Because we're to be like God. We're to be like we're to develop the character of God and, and all of his faithfulness. Is, that's, that's what we're trying to do here, right? So if we're called to be faithful in how we operate and how we live this life, we have to recognize that faithfulness is an expression, an external expression of what we believe. So that kind of moves us into part two of our outline talked about what it looks like, how it behaves. Let's talk about what faithfulness believes. This is that second definition I was telling you about, the conviction aspect, the, the veracity, the conformity to a truth. We have to, what you do is based on what you believe to be true. So let's take a look at uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. I'm going to read a few verses to you here, and we're going to kind of touch back to them you know, over the course of the rest of this message. But if we say we have fellowship with him, and we walk in darkness, we're lying and are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Go ahead and pull that next slide up for me. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So this, this passage is kind of pointing to something that is, is, is just a reality for all of us who live in this fallen world. It says if we don't walk in the truth, if we don't walk in the light, but rather we walk in darkness, then we're lying. We're being dishonest. We're not being uh, consistent with what we profess to believe. And here's this, this, this reality. Our dishonesty, mankind's dishonesty, is rooted in the accusation that God is a liar. That's something to chew on. Our, all of our dishonesty, all of our inconsistency, all of our lack of integrity can be traced back is rooted to the accusation that God is a liar, that God isn't telling the truth. The first sin, the first temptation in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't eating the apple. No, the first sin was, was mistrusting God. 
Check this out. In Genesis uh, 3, verses 4 through 6, right, this, the serpent comes up to Adam and Eve and says, hey, you know, how's tricks? And they're like, oh, life's pretty good. Actually, it's perfect. Uh, you know, we get to eat of these trees, and we get to play here, and we get to, you know, do this and that. But we can't eat of that tree. Uh, but, you know, everything else is, is good. And Satan says, wait, did God say you can't eat of that tree? And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, if we, if we eat it or we even touch it or look at it, we'll die. Um, but we get to eat all these other trees. And then Satan says this, no, you will not die. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And then the woman, watch this, then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took it and ate it and gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. It all stems from what? Was the sin eating the apple? No, the sin was believing that God wasn't telling them the truth. That God was in fact a liar. And since then, since that first sin, every sin that we commit, every act of dishonesty, every act of inconsistency is basic to mistrusting God. Believing that God's not telling the truth is the underlying reality for every single sin that we commit, that God's truth is false. So man's dishonesty starts the moment that you don't trust God's honesty. Here's the reality. I believe that we were born, we were created, we were designed to worship something. And because we've grown up in a, in a world, because we've lived and we were born into a world of sin, eventually we have come to believe that something besides God will satisfy that, that need to worship. So we've, we've, come to, we've come to realize that what we need, what we need to worship can be found outside of God. Think about it. I mean... Why are some people so afraid of being rejected? Right? They, 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 they seek approval in all these different areas. They try to get people to like them. They try to you know, do different things that they wouldn't necessarily normally do, but they're trying to get that acceptance from people. Why? Because there's a big lie right, that's, that's underneath everything else that's driving them that says, if people love you, then you'll live a worthwhile life. Then you'll be something. You'll be meaningful. Same, same reason why people, uh, why people have such a need, such a strong desire for, for money and for success because they've got this big lie, this undercurrent of a lie that says if you don't have a, a, a big you know, successful career and you don't have a lot of money and a lot of things, then you're nothing. You know, you're dirt. And so whether it's, whether it's uh, fear of rejection or whether it's, you know, it's seeking other people's approval or seeking, you know, fame and fortune and success and whatever, you're worshiping something that has taken the form of a lie and it, it controls you. It controls everything you do. Yeah, you're worshiping a lie instead of believing the truth. Abraham. Abraham believed God. Romans 4, 2, 3 says that if Abraham was justified by works, he's got something to brag about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Abraham had a pretty big test of faith. You guys know the story of whenever God asked him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac? Yeah, that, that took a lot of faith. But see, he... He, he knew God, he believed God, he believed that God was going to deliver, and he acted on that truth. He acted on the basis of that truth. You know, he didn't, he didn't see him saying like, oh, you know, God, I don't, I don't know if this is you, I, I don't think that this is going to work out. I mean, you know, he wasn't struggling, he wasn't fearful. I'm sure he had emotions, but he acted on the truth that he knew about God. And because of that, it was credit to him for, for righteousness. He didn't stagger at, at God's request. Instead, he just acted and he believed God. So he's, you know, he believed the truth. 
You know, if you're, okay, so if you're experiencing depression, you're depressed about something, right? Maybe not full-blown depression that's, you know, needs clinical treatment. That's a real thing. I'm not trying to downplay that. But if you're depressed one day, right, and you're feeling sorry for yourself, that's what it is. You're feeling sorry for yourself, and, and it's because there's a lie underneath there. You got this little voice inside you saying, what did I do to deserve this, right? It, sometimes you may say it out loud, but, you know, it's, it's an internal voice. What did I do to deserve this? That's a lie. Because if you're a Christian, well, you know the answer to that, right? You did everything to deserve this. <laughs> don't ask. I heard somebody say once, um, don't ever pray that God would give you justice because he just might do it. What would happen if God gave us what we deserved? Mm. If we prayed, God, give us justice at 12 o'clock at midnight tonight, there'd be nobody left on the planet Earth at 12.01. So here's a big one, right? Worry. Some people worry a lot. They're just, they're, they're worrying, they're, they're concerned, they're, their anxiety is just through the roof. And, and that, with that, that little voice that's going on inside is saying, you know, hey, you know, God, I, 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 if I were in charge of the universe, I would do a better job than the one who is in charge of the universe right now. I'm just saying, you know, well, God, I'm, I'm worried that, you know, that you're not going to get it right. I'm worried that you're going to mess it up. I'd do this differently, you know. And you may say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just consumed by worry. No, you're controlled by a lie. You are controlled by a lie. Instead of believing the truth about God, you are controlled by a lie because you're worshiping your own way, how you think sh things should be. Instead of realizing, instead of just waking up every morning and thinking, oh, God is good, God's gracious to me, he's kind, he's loving, and anything that happens to me today that is better than going to hell is a good thing, is gracious, is kind, is, is, is good, God is good. Instead of having that mentality, we, we sometimes shift into this other mentality. And now here's the deal. I know that things happen. We could, we, there's no way that we could root out all of the lies in our life. There's just too many of them. We won't ever root out all of the lies in our lives until we come face to face with Jesus. But the more that we root out, the more we'll actually live in freedom the more we'll actually live with purpose and in the, in the, in the calling that God has for our lives. I, I, I came across this cool, um, this cool book, and it's an old book, and I won't, I won't lie to you and be inconsistent and lack integrity and be dishonest and tell you that I read the whole book, but I did read parts of it, and the parts of it that I read were really cool. It's, called, it's, a, it's written by a, by a, uh, a theologian. And Thomas Brooks, and he wrote it in 1652, and it's called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And from what I read, I mean, it was, it was a killer book on Satan, like how to deal with Satan's lies. I mean, think, just l listen to the title, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. It's like, hey, here's a book on how to beat the devil. Here's what he's going to do, and here's how you're going to win. So, I mean... Yeah, I don't see why that one's not flying off the shelf. Probably because it's written in King James English. You know, that's not really a bestseller. But bear with me. I'm going to read you a couple of quotes. One of Satan's devices is he keeps people in a sad, doubting, questioning condition to make their life a hell by causing them to be thinking and using more on their sin than upon their Savior. So what he's saying is Satan's tactic is to get you to think more and more about your sin, to get you to live a sad, depressed, uh, unfulfilling life because you're focused on your sin instead of your Savior. Because if Satan can get you there, he can't do anything about your salvation. You're, you're still locked in and secure, but he can absolutely do something about your effectiveness here on earth. So he gives a remedy. He gave one of the devices, one of his tactics, and he gives a remedy. And this one's a little bit longer, but just bear with me. He says, the first remedy is to consider, to think about, that though Jesus Christ has not freed you from the presence of sin, 
He has freed you from the damning power of sin. It is most true that sin and grace were never born together, and neither shall sin and grace die together. But while you breathe in this world, sin and grace will live together, and they will keep house together in you. Christ in this life will not free any believer from the presence of sin, though he doth free every believer from the power of sin. For it says in Romans 8 that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The law cannot condemn you. And basically what I, what I gathered from this remedy is how many times do we mess up or do we commit a sin or we, 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 you know, we, we practice that thing that we don't want to do even though we, we, we hate it but we still do it, you know, that whole Romans 7 thing. And then we just wallow in it. Then we just think, oh, I've just disappointed you again, God. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just so, I'm just, I'm worthless. I, I, can't, I can't get a grip on this. And God's thinking what? Yeah, you really, you really messed this up. I didn't see that one coming. I mean, I thought you were done with that. I can't see the future. Oh, wait, no, I'm God. Of course I can see the future. So not only did I see that one coming, I see the next 345 times that you're going to do it. So doesn't it make more sense that God's not saying, oh, yeah, you did it again. You, you're a disappointment. No, he's, it's, it's more like he's like, okay, great, only 35 more times until you're done with that, until you're free of it. Okay, great, only 20 more times. We're almost there. He's, he's not disappointed in you because disappointment comes from unmet expectations. God doesn't have expectations. He sees everything, right. past, present, and future. So here's the deal. We don't need to focus on our sin. We need to focus on our Savior. We need to focus on the thing that, that is the point of the entire gospel, right? God's grace, God's mercy, God's kindness, God's faithfulness. The real sin that needs your repentance is the sin of being discouraged about your sin. The real sin that you need to repent of is not the sin that you commit. It's the sin of being discouraged, being wallowing in your own self-pity, thinking, thinking so little of the power and the, the, the everlastingness of God's love. Thinking that your little sin might somehow overwhelm God's purpose and calling for your life. I mean, that's ridiculous. That song, God's love is overwhelming. God's love is not overwhelmed. It's, it's over, it is overwhelming. It, God does the overwhelming. Your sin, your little thing is just a blip to God. It's not somehow gonna, gonna just overcome God with grief and disappointment. No, he's God. So repent from being discouraged. Next time you sin, let it be an opportunity to draw you back into the loving arms of your father. That's what he wants. If that wasn't what he wanted, then he would just heal everybody of sin. He would have taken us out of the, the power and the presence of sin. But no, we're here living in this world because we realize how much we need God in our times of failure. It's not a, it's not a, a list of record of wrongs. That's not what love is. Whew. So how faithfulness behaves, what faithfulness believes, we got to talk about where it begins. We got to talk about where it starts. It's like, yeah, okay, I, I get it. I need to be, I need to be faithful. I need to be truthful, truth centered. I need to have integrity and be honest, consistent through and through. And it all depends on what you believe to be the truth. But we have to learn. We have to know how to act on that truth. I'm going to read another passage in James. I got, I got, I'm on a James kick. James 2, and this one's hard, so I'm sorry, but sometimes you just need a kick in the butt, you know, and James is the perfect book to go to for that. Um, James 2, 14 through 20. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith from my works. You believe that God is one, and you do well. But the demons also believe, and they shudder. Foolish man, are you willing to learn 
that faith without works is useless. Yeah, that one's, it's kind of like, oof, James, gosh, you know, it's, could have done without that this morning. Here's the deal. What James is saying is faith or belief, right, uh, an intellectual understanding of God's truth is meaningless if it doesn't affect your life. Right? If your goal is to have a transformed life, you have to act on the truth that you say you believe. Because here's the deal. True, here, here's your point. True faith in anything will always lead to action. And I made this a, a bullet point because this is an absolutely true statement. And if you doubt the, 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 you know, the accuracy, if you doubt the validity of this, this statement, think about as you're listening to me make this statement, the air that you're breathing, the oxygen, right? You're just, I mean, did anybody think about the air they were breathing when they walked in? Did anybody think, oh, I hope the, the oxygen in this room is, is, is what my body needs and it's not mixed with some kind of like chemical gas that's going to harm my lungs, you know? No. You just, you're just breathing. Think about the chairs that you're sitting in. Did anybody come up to their chair and shake it around and check it and kick it and make sure that it was, you know, structurally, in, you know, intact and, and it was going to hold you? Do a few little, you know, jumps on it to make sure that it wasn't going to fall apart? No, you just sat down, Right? Think about the roof that's over your head. Anybody come in like worried about, oh gosh, I wonder if, I wonder if they got codes, you know. I know Scott was probably thinking, uh, is this thing up to codes? No, you just came in and didn't even think about the roof. No, you just had faith in the normalities of, of, of daily living. So you have plenty of faith. We don't need more faith. That's not the issue here. You sat down. You came into this room. You breathed the air. Even though you didn't know the person who designed and built the chair, you didn't know the architect who developed the roof, you, maybe you don't know the God who, who created the air and, that you're breathing. But you trust, based off of time and experience with these objects, that it's going to do what it needs to do for you. So we don't need more faith. What we need is we need more knowledge about the object in which we place our faith. We need to know more about the thing that we put our faith in. You know, I think back to the, the guy in, uh, in the Gospels that, that's, that says, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. You know, he's not asking for more faith. What he needs is he needs to know more Jesus. He needs to get to know, he needs to intimately experience Jesus. And so we don't need to ask for more faith. We need to get to know the one who we place our faith in. Because here's the deal. The more time and experience, intimate experience you have with God, the more faith that you're going to have. Because just like this chair, you've sat in it over and over and over and over and over again every, every week, and it's always held you up, and you've gotten to the point now where you don't even have to think about it. You're not worried about it. It's not even a second thought. It's the same way with God. You can have multiple experiences over and over again where he's come through, and he's delivered on what he says he's going to do, and it becomes to the point where you don't even give it a second thought. You just believe him. So we need more knowledge about the object in which we place our faith. Because here's the deal. We can put our faith in the wrong things, right? If we don't know about something that we're putting our faith in, we're just kind of blindly, you know, stepping out. It could, it could have some pretty rough consequences. Um, I have this story uh, that is a fond memory of mine. Um, I, was probably, I was probably 13, 14. So Christian was 8, I think. And uh, we were at, my, um, we were at my, my mom's parents' house in Georgia. His name, we called him Poppy. We were at Poppy's house. And there's this tree out in the front yard that's like the perfect climbing tree. I mean, it's got limbs that go all the way up that are just, you know. I mean, it's, it, I wouldn't change a limb on there, except for one. Um, but me and Christian were out climbing this tree. And I'm, I'm climbing up first, right, because obviously um, I'm 
older and better. Uh, so I'm climbing up first, and we get a, we, you know, we pass five feet, 10 feet, get up to about 15 feet, and I go to step on this branch, and I can tell it's not, it's not stable. It does not have integrity, okay? So I choose a different branch, and then I get up on this next branch, and I look back and I say, hey, Christian, don't step on that branch because it's going to break. It's not going to hold your weight. He's like, okay, yeah, okay. So I keep climbing, and, and I look back, and he's got his foot on that branch. I'm like, Dude, Christian, don't step on that branch. I'm telling you, it's not going to hold your weight. He's like, okay, I'm not. I'm not, geez. So then I keep climbing her here, and he falls like 15 feet on the ground, breaks his collarbone. I was freaked out. I jumped down and, you know, picked him up and carried him inside. But I just want to be like, you idiot. I told you not to step on that branch. Twice I told you. Why? Because I had experience with that branch. He didn't. He didn't know he didn't intimately know that that branch wouldn't hold him. And so he put his faith in the wrong object, right? Is he in here? Where you at? Uh-huh. I told him I was going to tell a story about him, so he's probably hiding in the bathroom. Yeah, thanks. So you have to, you have, to have knowledge about the thing you're putting your faith in. Um, so this... this this passage that we just read in James, it talks about, you know, faith doesn't save you, no, it's works. And so you could get this idea that, okay, but we just read back in Romans chapter 4, Paul said that Abraham was justified by his faith and not by his works, because if it was his works, then he would have had something to brag about. But then you've got James here saying, no, it's not your faith, it's, it's your works. So you got seemingly, you know, contradicting arguments here from Paul and James, but it's not, it's not contradicting. In fact, it's, it's not faith or works. It's faith that works. And actually, James is on the same page as, as Paul because he continues on in James 2.21. He says, wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works. And by works, faith was perfected. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So it's not faith or works, it's faith that works. See, it's, it, they're together. You can't have one without the other. Because the reality is that if, if you believe that God saved you, that, that, that Jesus Christ died on a cross, that God, the creator of the universe, entered his creation in the form of a man, lived a perfect sinless life, and then hung on a cross and died, God died, so that you could have life and freedom. If you truly believe that happened, you can't do anything but respond with action. It has to manifest. It has to affect you somehow in your life. So it's faith that works because Abraham believed God. It doesn't say that Abraham believed in God. It says that Abraham believed God. It's one thing to believe in God, but it's a whole different thing to believe God. It's much harder. So believing God, believing that he is true, believing that what he says is going to, is going to, come, to come to pass. So this this belief, this intellectual understanding has to be moved into an action if you're wanting transformation in your life, if you really want it to change you. So we find ourselves daily interacting with lies from the enemy. Why do we do that? Why do we believe the lies from the enemy instead of believing God's truth? I'm going to give you a little four-step process that's going to help um, take your, your, your belief and move it into action. Because there's, a, there's an element here that we all deal with, and it's this, this crazy, mysterious, unpredictable thing called emotion. Feeling. It doesn't even feel good saying it. I don't even like saying it. Emotion. Feeling. Blech. I'm just kidding. Everybody's got feelings. Anybody who says they don't have feelings... Well, they're not telling the truth. <laughs> they don't have integrity. They're a liar. 
Everybody's just, everybody's got feelings. Some just don't know how to express them or know what they are or how to deal with them. Um, but here's the deal. The steps to faith that works. First, you have to know the truth. Okay, that's important. Some people don't know the truth. You have to know the truth. Then you have to believe the truth. Okay, believe that it's God's word and that what God says is true. Then you have to take action on the truth. Finally, wait for your emotions to adjust to the truth. Maybe. Hopefully they will. If they don't, that's, that's like a four in parentheses. But what ends up happening is we, our emotion, we, we get it backwards. Our emotions come up and we choose to think on what we feel rather than what we know to be true. You ever had that happen? Let me give you another example. Um, Christian's in this one too, though it's not nearly as funny. Uh, so me and Reagan and Christian, my siblings, we went on, we decided we were going to go skydiving, okay? And it was super cool. We went out to uh, Chattanooga, and there was like a, you know, like a 14,000-foot drop, and then there was like you could pay extra and do like an 18,000-foot drop, which is like the highest drop in Tennessee that you can do. So, of course, we did that one. And we got in this plane, and I wasn't expecting the plane to be sort of like a, just a rickety, you know, like single person plane. There was like 12 of us in there. And we're flying up and flying up. We get to 12,000 feet, and then there's seven other people in the plane with us that didn't pay the extra, so they jumped at 12,000 feet. And so we're, I'm, we're sitting in the back, and we're watching them, and they just, boom, out the window. And that's a weird thing, to be in a plane, look at the person in front of you, and all of a sudden they're not in the plane anymore. <laughs> at that moment, I was like, oh, this is going to happen. And I'm going to fall from higher than they're falling. They just disappeared. So then they all jump, and we fly up, you know, further, and, and, then, uh, <laughs> and then Reagan goes first. And she's like, ah! <laughs> And I was like, oh, gosh. And then Christian, he'd done it before, so he was, like, ready, you know. And he goes, and then I'm sitting on the edge, and I feel it, you know. Like, you know, I don't want to admit it, but, yeah, I, I feel kind of freaked out. Like, okay. I'm about to jump out of a perfectly good plane, and there's a chance that my parachute won't open. There's a chance that I could fall and go splat. But I could have chose to, to stay focused on that feeling, right? I'm freaked out, and it would have caused me to come to all sorts of different conclusions. But I didn't. Instead, I jumped. I, I, I thought, you know, I just watched all these other people jump out, and they're fine, I think. Uh, <laughs> but this is, this is people, people go skydiving all the time. These, these things are professionally packed, right? They're certified, you know, in, in, in the parachutes. There's a ripcord. There's a backup. You know, I got to believe this plane has been, you know, inspected by the, you know, the, the what is it, FFA? Is that <laughs> FAA? FFA, that's probably farming or something. <laughs> I got to believe that that was it. So I start thinking about... I, I choose to believe, I choose to act on what I know to be true about this whole experience, and I jumped. And for the first, like, six seconds, you're actually falling. You're like, you know that feeling of falling? That's happening. But then you reach terminal velocity, and then it's all of a sudden just like the ground is getting closer, and I was pumped. I mean, it was the coolest thing I had ever done in my life. I mean, I free fall for like four minutes. And then, boom, pulled the parachute. Parachute came out just fine landed on the ground, and then me and Christian started talking about how we could get our skydiving license so we could do it, you know, all the time. I mean, I was ready to go again and again and again. So you got you to gotta play this out in your everyday life. You know the truth. Focus on the truth, not on what you feel. Because that's why some people who call themselves believers, they don't act on what they profess to believe. It's either because they don't know the truth they doubt that the truth is the truth. They don't accept it to be true. But more, than, more, than, more often than not, it's because they haven't found the willpower to act on the truth. So that's what it's all about. They choose to f set their minds on what they feel rather than what they know. And so my last point for you is true faithfulness requires us to set our minds on the truth rather than focusing on how we feel. I'm going to close with this thought. You know, we kind of live in a world that, um, that portrays success as, uh, you know, good performance plus good outcome equals success, right? But in God's 
kingdom and God's economy, that's not how success is defined. If, if God is love, and God in multiple verses throughout scripture says, if you love me, obey my commands. If you love me, do what I ask you to do. It's for your benefit. Then what is success in God's kingdom? Obedience, faithfulness, acting on the truth, responding in your life in a way that, that reflects God's truth in your life, being consistent outwardly with what you claim to believe inwardly. And so if obedience to God is success in the kingdom, we can stop being disappointed when the outcome is not like what we thought it would be. You ever had an instance where God, you felt like God wanted you to do something or you read clearly in scripture where God says to do something and you did it and the outcome maybe seemed like a failure in the world's eyes. Maybe you did something and it, by most standards in the world, it didn't seem like a, like a success. It doesn't matter. The outcome is not a, not, a, not a factor in this equation. Obedience to God is success. Like, for example, you know, a lot of people would say if they see this, this church that's growing, right, turning into a mega church, getting all these new people, that that church is doing something right because they're just growing like a weed, you know. Well, that's not necessarily the case because the, the measure of success in the kingdom is not quantity of people. The measure of success is obedience. I would rather have a small church with a group of obedient Submitted, determined, honest, truth-centered Christians than a megachurch of lukewarm, weak-willed Christians. Any day of the week. When we allow our obedience to be the thing that we strive for, when we allow our faithfulness to be the thing that we're after, that drives us, that's where our relationship with God becomes God's relationship with the world around us. That's how we can affect change, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of everyone we encounter. So God, thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being a God who is consistent, who is truthful, who is absolutely full of integrity. That we don't ever have to wonder if you're gonna do what you say because you can't not do what you say. It's who you are. So God, knowing that to be true about you, let us emulate that. Let it affect our lives. Give us the, the, the grace, your empowering presence to be all that we were intended to be and do all that we were intended to do. Help us to act on your truth. Help us to, to, to not focus on our emotions, to not focus on what the world expects, to not focus on trying to succeed in the world's eyes. God, but Help us to focus on what we know to be true about you and to have the courage to act on it. Let us be that kind of church. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that your love is overwhelming and not overwhelmed by our sins, by our screw-ups. Thank you, God, that those sins are just opportunities to draw us closer to you. You are a good God. And nobody made you good. You just are. It's who you are. So thank you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys had a good day? You know, I started the service off at home with two sick kids. And then my wife and I decided right when she got off the stage to just flop. Um, so, man, so thankful for you guys. So thankful. Um, are you awake? We up? So, uh, in the spirit of being awake, I thought, hey, why don't we just learn to clap? Let's learn to yell. Let's learn to scream. And we'll start out by somewhere. Is Brian here? Did he just go to the bathroom? Well, when Brian walks back in, everybody just like, clap and yell and scream and stuff like that. Brian's my uncle Brian. He lives in St. Augustine, Florida, and he's here visiting. I think it's the first time he's been here that I've been here at the church. Um, But, you know, we had a celebration of life uh, for my Mima yesterday, and 
it's God's timing is impeccable. And I know everybody doesn't understand this. People deal with grief differently. People deal with um, sadness. People deal with loss. But our family loves church. Um, it's not work. It's not a burden. It's a relief. It's a healing. And so for us to have a celebration of life on Saturday and worship Jesus Christ on Sunday, that's something to shout about. And let me tell you something else to shout about. We have a volunteer rally right after this. And if you knew my family, for true knew my family, and if you knew me, Ma, that volunteer rally is the perfect timing to happen. It's a celebration. You see, we're coming up on Easter. We're coming up on some big events in American culture as church. And we need volunteers. We need people to understand the vision. We need people to understand why we're here. The cool part, not to discourage you from coming to the volunteer rally, is that our church has an amazing, amazing percentage of volunteers. And so we are so thankful. Everybody give it up for Brian for your swag. Brian! Brian's in the room. Brian, we wanted you to come up and say a few things. I'm just kidding. <laughs> in the true spirit of Mima, I have to tell you guys a funny story. A couple weeks ago, maybe it was even last week, I don't know. It's been a blur. I told a story about a song that meant a lot to me in my marriage. <laughs> and I'm an idiot because it was the wrong song. <laughs> and I got up here and I even told the timeline of when it was recorded. And I get off the stage and, and, and my wife's like, dude, she's laughing at me. And I'm like, what did I do? And she's like, that was the wrong song. And then she told me another song. And I'm like, that's not right. So then I go to the bathroom and my sister meets me coming out of the bathroom and she says, hey, that was the wrong song. And I said, really? And she told me the right song. So me and my wife, neither one knew the right song. <laughs> but this is the right song. It was recorded in midsummer 2012, which makes a lot more sense to six years into my marriage rather than like way off into my marriage. Me and I would have loved that. She would have loved the humility. She would have loved the laughter. So let's celebrate. This is not sad. This is happy. And this is a song about a redemption, no matter where you are or what you've done. It's a song where my wife and I were sitting and we heard it. And again, if you were here, you heard me say we cried like babies, ugly cried, and we saw each other for the first time. This is a situation where if you've gone through divorce, if you've gone through um, loss, suffering, pain, you know the on the other side, you can see it. But if you're not there yet, it's hard to see. So let's sing.
so much for this amazing day. God, we just ask that you just fill us up this week. We love you, God. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. There'll be offering baskets at the back. Get ready to fill your, uh, your tummies with some sandwiches and some chips and some drinks and some good time. Y'all ready? <laughs> 